Hello everyone. Uh, today's lecture is going to be on uh, salivary gland diseases and imaging. Uh, this is going to be a two-part lecture. And uh, in the first part, uh, these will be your learning outcomes. So let's jog our memory a little bit uh, first to understand uh, salivary gla gland disorders. Uh, we first uh, need to uh, reprise our memory on uh, the anatomy and the of the salivary glands. Uh, gland is basically that consists of specialized types of cells wherein they produce products which are uh, used elsewhere in the body. And uh, salivary glands are complex uh, tubulocene or exocrine uh, glands secreting uh, saliva. And uh, saliva is the major product of uh, major and minor salivary glands and uh, is distributed throughout the oral cavity. Uh, the saliva is generally a complex mixture of organic inorganic components and water carrying out several functions um, To put in short there are three pairs of uh, major salivary glands namely uh, parotid submandibular and sublingual glands and in addition to that there are numerous uh, minor salivary glands as well uh, we all know that uh, the salivary uh, the per uh, development of salivary gland uh, the parotid starts to develop between fourth to sixth week of intrauterine life and uh, submandibular gland around the sixth week and the sublingual gland uh, including the uh, minor salivary glands uh, develops somewhere roughly about eighth to twelfth week of the embryonic life uh, the varial, uh, various uh, developmental stages are the bud formation, epithelial cord formation, branching and glandular differentiation and canalization and cytodifferentiation. Um, I hope you all remember the histopathologic diagram of uh, formation or the development of uh, salivary glands that uh, we have been uh, doing. And uh, the as we go on further, uh, let's just uh, uh, look into the uh, salivary glands that are present. So salivary glands can be classified like I told you earlier, minor and major salivary glands. Uh, major will be the parotid, uh, submandibular and sublingual glands and uh, minor salivary glands will be the labial, buccal, glossopalatine, palatine and lingual uh, will be present in uh, the lingual areas of the oral cavity. Uh, based upon uh, the type of secretion, the salivary glands can be uh, classified as a serous mucus or mixer type. Uh, depending on uh, the type of saliva that is produced or the uh, type of secreting cells that are present within it. Uh, the parotid gland uh, and the von Ebner's gland are uh, purely serous uh, while minor salivary glands like uh, uh, that are present glossopalatine, palatine and anterior lingual glands are purely mucus. The mixed type of gland are submandibular, sublingual, labial, buccal and the posterior uh, lingual glands. So when we go about the clinical anatomy, uh, the parotid uh, gland is a paired gland. That is, uh, it is con it is it, it is present at both the, the left and the right side and uh, are situated posterior to the mandibular ramus and anterior and inferior to the external auditory ear on the either side of the face. Um, they are the largest uh, salivary glands uh, and uh, the facial nerve and its branches pass through the parotid making it a very complex and uh, important structure um, uh, making uh, thus making uh, uh, surgery on parotid gland uh, difficult. The main duct is uh, duct of the salivary gland is known as the stencils duct and it uh, empties into the buccal cavity lateral to the maxillary second molar. And, uh, the opening of the duct is marked by a ridge of tissue known as the parotid papilla and uh, which can be clinically visible within the oral cavity and is often uh, you know uh, misdiagnosed to be a, a, a fibroma or sometimes you know it is enhanced in some people which is often misdiagnosed accessory parotid uh, tissue is commonly observed next to uh, main gland uh, around the duct uh, moving on to minor salivary glands, uh, you have the submandibular gland, mm, the which is divided into superficial and deep lobes by the mylohyoid muscle. So it's kind of like a U-shaped uh, gland, which is kind of divided by the mylohyoid muscle, again making it uh, complex and challenging in terms of operating. And in humans, the submandibular gland accounts to 70% uh, of the salivary volume produced by the major glands. And uh, despite... Uh, 
despite parotid being larger than submandibular uh, salivary gland the main uh, duct uh, of submandibular gland is known as the barton's duct and is found in superficial portion uh, of the gland and the duct uh, hooks around the myeloid muscle and uh, proceeds along the superficial surface the duct uh, eventually drains into the sublingual uh, caruncles on either side of the lingual frenum and uh, the duct pass uh, passes the lingual nerve uh, which is another very important uh, anatomy which uh, intervenes uh, so it is very important that uh, we take uh, the passing lingual nerve into account whenever we are trying to operate uh, on a submandibular gland this making it a little challenging uh, moving on to sublingual gland the sublingual gland uh, uh, in contrast to other uh, Uh, in contrast to uh, parotid and uh, submandibular gland uh, is a composite structure made up of a large segment of uh, 8 to 30 mixed minor glands and uh, each with its own duct opening to the sublingual fold uh, these multiple ducts are known as the ducts of uh, 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 rivinus and uh, uh, hence uh, and the main duct is called the bartholin duct so what we uh, we should understand is that uh, sublingual gland does not uh, open into the uh, oral cavity is just one single duct it has multiple ducts and uh, generally uh, it is accounted to roughly about 8 7 or 8 uh, ducts and uh, the major duct is the bartholin and uh, others are called the duct of uh, rivinus and uh, um, this ducts uh, join the barton duct to drain uh, uh, through the sublingual caruncle while uh, the smaller ducts open in an elevated crest along the sublingual fold the three uh, major glands are uh, surrounded by uh, connective tissue capsule uh, the minor glands whereas uh, does not have any uh, capsule surrounding them so uh, the other minor salivary glands that we discussed before they just lie under the mucosa and distributed over the lips cheeks palate and floor of mouth and the retromolar area and also appear in the upper uh, aero digestive uh, tract and contribute to 10% of the total salivary volume the functions of the salivary gland is that uh, its major uh, production is that uh, it uh, produces saliva and uh, saliva is the thing that facilitates a uh, lot of uh, things so as we know it is mainly secreted and produced by the salivary gland and the total volume of saliva secreted in an adult is roughly about uh, 600 to 1000 ml which in which 60% more than 60% is uh, secreted by the submandibular gland uh, remember what i told uh, more than 70% of uh, salivary production among the major salivary glands is contributed by the uh, submandibular gland whereas if you uh, take the whole saliva production uh, in the mouth that is including the major and minor salivary gland 60% is uh, 60% is uh, you know secreted by submandibular glands 30% by the parotid and 5% by the lingual and 7% by minor salivary glands um, the ph range of saliva is somewhere roughly about 6 to 7 um however uh, the salivary secretion is a reflex action that uh, arises from salivary centers dependent on a uh, different uh, nafferent uh, simulation the uh, i hope you all remember something from school the reflexes uh, where a bell is rung in front of a dog and a meat is given and uh, uh, it is constantly repeated and one day when you ring the bell so the Uh, dog starts salivating so this uh, is a classic uh, example of like how salivary secretion uh, can be a reflex action and the sublingual and the minor salivary glands spontaneously secrete saliva through uh, the bulk of secretion and is uh, nerve mediated the normal average salivary flow ranges from um, 0.1 to 0.3 ml uh, per minute Um, moving on to uh, the composition of the saliva saliva is mainly composed of uh, electrolytes like sodium potassium chloride bicarbonate calcium magnesium phosphate fluoride um, thiocyanide 
and uh, secretory proteins and uh, peptides like amylase uh, uh, proline rich proteins uh, histin uh, cystatin uh, peroxidase lysozyme uh, lactoferrin uh, uh, histatin uh, glycoproteins uh, lysozyme uh, defensins uh, they also contain uh, immunoglobulins such as IgG, IgM, IgA and organic components like glucose, amino acids, urea, uric acid, lipids uh, um, and also have epidermal growth factors, epithelial cells, insulin, um, um, binding proteins and uh, serum albumin. Um, biologically um, active peptides like leptin, uh, endothelin are also identified. Um, and uh, f uh, functions uh, is that it helps in lubrication and movement of the oral tissues against each other and uh, uh, deglutition, mastication and deglutition of food aids, aids in digestion, in taste perception, neutralizes by buffering action and uh, of the bacteria acids and uh, thereby promotes uh, remineralization by reducing dissolution of the uh, enamel mm, by inhibiting inhibiting the calcium phosphate uh, precipitate. The saliva overall protects the teeth and oral mucosa by the presence of uh, immunoglobulins and uh, tissue receptive factors and uh, it, uh, its antibacterial uh, system. So moving on to salivary gland uh, diseases and disorders, uh, it can be classified as uh, functional disorders, obstructive disorders, infective disorders and uh, neoplastic disorders based on its uh, nature um, as etiologic uh, etiopathologic factor as to how uh, the disease or disorder came to be and uh, can also be specifically uh, 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 classified as developmental mucosils and ranula inflammatory and reactive lesions silolithiasis immune conditions and granulomatous conditions salivary gland tumors this first part of lectures we will be going through a few uh, um, and uh, to diagnose any of the uh, salivary gland disorders again um, it is very essential it all starts with uh, patient history and examination uh, careful history is uh, very helpful in evaluating uh, salivary gland disease and will often suggest a um, uh, very preemptive diagnosis the duration of the disease and description of the symptoms and the patient's age are particularly very important and uh, it's very helpful when you for when you want to formulate a salivary gland uh, uh, disease related diagnosis uh, the salivary uh, um, the salivary gland uh, uh, history uh, involves in uh, uh, getting a history of dry mouth which is a very common symptom of uh, salivary gland disease and disorders and uh, the past and present medical history because a lot of it is linked to patients medical history which we will be discussing further as we discuss the diseases specifically when it comes to clinical examination salivary gland examination involves uh, palpating the upper neck tissues uh, located under the mandible uh, for the submandibular uh, salivary glands and uh, anterior to the ear for the parotid gland and as well as observing the um, uh, salivary effluent uh, punctum resulting from uh, bimanual palpation. Uh, acutely inflamed uh, glands are ex exquisitely tender while uh, the gland is usually non-tender in uh, chronic uh, sialadenitis. Inside the mouth, uh, palpation of the submandibular gland orifices anterior to the base of the tongue in the floor of the mouth and parotid gland orifices opposite to the upper second molar is required in order to uh, uh, determine any pathology. In a normal patient massaging the parotid gland from the posterior to the anterior express uh, clear saliva from the parotid duct uh, should be visible. Uh, purulent uh, saliva that is with pus discharge uh, are uh, generally seen in bacterial parotitis and uh, uh, sometimes uh, yellowish uh, granules may be expressed in uh, chronic sialadenitis. If uh, no saliva appears, it might, uh, it is most likely directive to uh, salivary gland uh, hypofunction. 
or uh, xerostomia and uh, separation from the gland orifice indicates acute or chronic inflammation of the salivary gland um, and uh, ideally uh, doing a salivary culture and sensitivity testing is uh, becomes uh, essential fever and swelling pain um, or erythema over the affected uh, gland or the duct affected is uh, generally suggestive of sialadenitis and then conditions such as tumors uh, all the major uh, salivary glands should be palpated for masses asymmetry of uh, face uh, in most of the salivary gland tumors are noticed and should be taken uh, into account and uh, uh it is necessary to perform bimanual palpation for uh, the submandibular salivary gland um and uh, um uh, because they might uh, give us a very good uh, clue about the extent of the tumor uh, facial asymmetry at the wrist during movement must be carefully addressed in order to detect uh, even faint and minor degrees of facial nerve palsy because uh, if you remember i already mentioned that uh, the facial nerve passes through the parotid gland hence uh, any uh, tumor uh, or any invasive uh, disease uh, involving the parotid gland for example might affect the facial nerve thus it becomes very important uh, and uh, we also uh, learned that the lingual nerve is uh, in close contact with the submandibular uh, salivary gland duct uh, hence uh, nerve examinations can uh, cranial nerve examination uh, also can play a, uh, play a very key role in terms of diagnosing uh, whether to uh, to give us a clue as to how invasive the um, uh, disease or a disorder for example a tumor or a neoplasm has invaded into the salivary gland uh, especially nerve examination of the fifth uh 7th uh 9th and the 12th uh, cranial nerves uh is very essential and also in some cases uh, uh examination uh, of the eyes uh, can also give us uh, certain clues uh, we all know apart from this uh, uh, salivary gland sil uh, salivary diagnostics or salivary histochemistry is playing a very important role these days a lot of diagnosis is based on analysis of the saliva that is being collected apart from the salivary gland imaging that we do uh, in the clinical setup itself uh, however conclusively for any major diseases and disorders a uh, biopsy or a fine needle aspiration biopsy of the salivary gland Uh, will be essential uh, these are the diagnostic approaches uh, as to uh, how to approach a salivary gland uh, disease or a disorder uh, when i so in uh, radiographic examination uh, we have uh, um, plain film radiography uh, ultrasonography ultrasonography radionucleotide imaging computer tomography and magnetic resonance image uh, conventional uh, radiographs include uh, oblique lateral films of the mandible intraoral occlusal views and proposterior views of the parotid region and panoramic radiography although uh, standard uh, radiographic views uh, of the plain film radiographies uh, are obtained uh, routinely to uh, detect majorly hard structures uh, for example like a salivary gland calculi in the past they have now been uh, they have now been replaced mostly with uh, cross sectional imaging techniques such as ct or uh, mri uh, ct is uh, least sensitive uh, because uh, 60 to 80% uh, 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 only 60 to 80% of the salivary gland calculi are radio opaque so uh, the conventional radiography can uh, miss out uh, 20 to 40% of the calcula in most cases that is uh, it, it all depends on the degree of calcification uh, that occurs within the uh, you know within the salivary gland calcula uh, in the images given here itself you can observe that in the ct image the arrow where you see the salivary gland calcula is very well demarcated where is it is very dull and light in Uh, the occlusal radiograph uh, in the image below uh, shown image below so uh, 
in addition uh, a variety of uh, pre existing calcification such as uh, fibrolates tonsillolates and uh, lymph node calcifications may be mistaken for a salivary gland calculus in uh, conventional radiographs um, however uh, uh, salivary gland uh, calculus can be differentiated and can be sometimes clearly identified in uh, uh, certain conventional radiographs and uh, panoramic uh, views so moving on to salivary gland diseases and disorders we'll be discussing uh, other factors related to salivary gland diagnostics and treatment modalities as we go further and as we start learning uh, each and every disorder as we go on uh, because uh, understanding uh, the disease first uh, can uh, you know give us a clear uh, idea as to what type of uh, approach we should take in terms of making a conclusive diagnosis and what type of approach we should take in terms of treatment of uh, the lesion okay to start off with mucosal uh, one of the most commonest uh, salivary gland disorders that we will uh, come across uh, in the oral cavity uh, among various uh, age groups um, the etiology you can uh, base it on two uh, categories the extravasation type which is caused due to the physical injury uh, traumatic injury to minor salivary gland uh, sec excretory duct and uh, the mucus extravasation into uh, periductal soft tissue which produces a local inflammatory response and uh, granulation tissue uh, known as encapsulation and the variants are uh, superficial mucosal and uh, there is a mucus pool at the epithelial connective tissue junction and possible uh, possibly due to trauma or systemic uh, etiology uh, which is hormonal in nature and uh, clinical presentation it uh, mostly presents uh, in the lower lip uh, as the most common site and also in the buccal mucosa and anterior and ventral tongue uh, but uh, the incidence of uh, mucosal has been recorded in almost every single surface where minor salivary glands uh, are present sometimes uh, even in the retromolar area along the third molar area whenever there is an eruption of third molar accidental biting of the uh, buccal uh, uh, tissue buccal mucosa in the retromolar area have also shown uh, uh, mucosal presence of mucosal in those areas generally presents as a plain plain painless bluish hue uh, uh, because of the presence of uh, mucin uh, that is collection of the saliva salivary uh, saliva within the cavity uh, along the surface and uh, it often uh, varies in uh, terms of size and uh, diagnosis is generally uh, mostly with uh, clinical and uh, most of the people uh, uh, might uh, remember history of trauma of accidental biting or uh, injury uh, to that particular area along with microscopic findings uh, differential diagnosis uh, can be hemangioma or pyogenic granuloma uh, salivary neoplasm connective tissue neoplasm uh, depending on the site of the site of uh, and uh, treatment is generally excision with uh, uh, excision with associated minor salivary glands because uh, sometimes uh, there is recurrence uh, patient might accidentally break the mucosal that is the uh, inflammation and uh, once the mucin drains out it will go back to be uh, it will go back to become normal uh, that is uh, the swelling might disappear over a period of time but the problem with that is recurrence it keeps coming back so generally the preferred modality of treatment is excision of the entire minor salivary gland um, associated uh, with the disease and uh, after you do the excision uh, the prognosis is actually very good but uh, um, provided that it is not done properly there is always a chance for uh, occasional uh, recurrence while we talk about mucosal uh, there is one more phenomenon that uh, uh, we need to remember is uh, mucus retention cyst which we will be seeing a little further uh, probably in the next class uh, but just to um, you know kind of concisely uh, tell about it it, uh, it is a dilatation of the salivary excretory duct and due to up, uh, obstruction so sometimes there is a confusion between mucosal and uh, mucus retention cyst 
please not confuse mucosal occurs in a minor salivary gland whereas mucus retention cyst uh, mucus retention also happens in mucosal but mucus retention cyst specifically happens majorly in uh, duct obstruction in uh, an inflammation of the duct in major salivary glands uh, more of major salivary glands due to uh, silolith formation so these two uh, concepts are not to be uh, moving on to uh, ranula mm, uh, it is the obstruction of the sublingual or the submandibular salivary gland by a silolith or by trauma uh, remember i told you uh, we talked or discussed about the anatomy of the uh, ducts of the sublingual gland so the major uh, bartholin duct uh, goes and connects itself to the warthans and uh, the others drain individually as in eight or nine different so this can be among any or uh, any among the minor uh, uh, ducts that are opening along the uh, along with the major duct or it can happen in the major duct itself it is secondary to obstruction and extravasation of saliva into the soft tissue of the floor of the mouth the clinical presentation is usually unilateral fluctuant and soft tissue mass in the floor of the mouth and usually has a bluish and uh, translucent uh, quality uh, hence the name uh, ranula ranula is something uh, that is derived from the uh, from the frog uh, from uh, the appearance that a frog or a toad gives uh, with its you know the throat uh, turns to uh, you know swell up so uh, hence the name ranula when uh, when uh, it is uh, above the myeloid muscle the presentation is usually intraoral in nature so you might uh, generally observe it beneath the tongue whenever uh, so uh, patients with uh, larger ranula can have displacement in tongue and can have discomfort in enlargement of the tongue and uh, and uh, in extra vasation extends below the myeloid muscle uh, it forms a plunging ranula um, occlusion uh, occlusal radiographs might uh, generally uh, uh, reveal a suspected uh, silolith diagnosis of uh, ranula is generally done with uh, demonstration of a silolith and uh, soft tissue imaging uh, with uh, uh, such as with mri and uh, aspiration of the mucus uh, salivary fluid and uh, and uh, after we perform an uh, incisional biopsy we might be able to see granulation tissue lining around the mucin pool differential diagnosis for ranula can be a dermoid cyst salivary gland tumor soft tissue tumor uh, cystic hygroma or thymic cyst treatment is generally uh, marsupialization as an initial procedure and uh, where we tend to drain the mucin and uh, since there are multiple ducts that contribute so if in case if it is just a minor duct um, there can be an uh, you know an uh, accessory connection that can form and it can you know kind of heal uh, time over so that is why marsupialization is preferred as a primary procedure then an excision of the involved gland if that doesn't uh, work out uh, mostly in extra vasation types in terms of uh, plunging ranula and uh, silolithotomy uh, in terms of uh, obstructive type uh, where you find uh, silolith as the causative factor for this usually uh, there is the prognosis is generally uh, good uh, and uh, sometimes um, if the mechanism of the lith formation keeps continuing there is a small chance of uh, recurrence or ranula moving on to siladenitis uh, siladenitis is uh, inflammatory condition that uh, affects the salivary glands and uh, parotid gland is the most commonly affected uh, glands uh, among uh, the major salivary glands the main etiologic factors uh, can be either infectious or non infectious uh, non infectious in nature um, uh, it, uh, infectious can be bacterial and viral in nature and uh, bacterial silenitis is caused because of retrograde spread of uh, infection secondary to decreased uh, salivary flow or ductal obstruction and uh, decreased salivary uh, flow can be secondary to medications uh, dehydration or uh, other debilitating uh, conditions ductal obstructions can be due to silolithiasis strictures within the ductal system and common 
which is very common in submandibular salivary glands due to pressure effect from adjacent tumors. And uh, Staphylococcus aureus is the most common etiologic agent for acute bacterial uh, sialadenitis or parotitis when it occurs in the parotid gland. In addition to uh, Staphylococcus pyogens, Streptococcus viridens and uh, other microorganisms. Uh, viruses causing uh, sialadenitis in, uh, include a paramyxovirus uh, uh, which causes mumps, uh, most common uh, in mumps and Coxsackie virus cytomegalovirus uh, etc the patient might present with uh, fever and dehydration and uh, clinical features generally uh, clinically there is a sudden pain at the uh, angle of the jaw which is unilateral and glandular enlargement and tender to palpation with uh, uh, purulent discharge over the stent's uh, duct and uh, when we talk about uh, uh, sialadenitis individually uh, then uh, it is it is most common that it can uh, occur either individually or collectively. Individually, when we talk about it in specific glands, um, uh, sometimes apart from the above said uh, uh, conditions, uh, you can also see uh, post-operative parotitis uh, that is inflammation of the uh, parotid gland. Uh, a etiology is from uh, Sialadenitis, which uh, occurs after major surgical procedure, and uh, clinical feature is almost similar to that of uh, sialadenitis. Uh, mumps uh, is an acute paramyxovirus induced uh, infection of uh, parotid salivary gland. Uh, it is a contagious infection spreading through airborne droplets or direct uh, contact of saliva. The peak incidence of mumps is reported during. Uh, the winter and uh, spring season. The clinical features uh, generally there is um, the infection of mumps ranges from three to four days after onset of disease. Due to, due, during the prodromal phase of the disease the patient might complain of uh, low grade fever, muscle pain, headache and malaise. And uh, um, and uh, during uh, and uh, Apart from that, patient might also complain of low-grade fever, muscle pain, headache, and uh, uh, followed by uh, uh, enlargement of the parotid salivary gland associated with pain, which is uh, which becomes very severe uh, while the patient is chewing uh, or uh, masticating the food. Uh, inflammation of the salivary gland starts reducing by the uh, end of first week, and uh, patient returns to normal. Um, usually by 10 days. Um, treatment is uh, symptomatic uh, treatment with mumps vaccination MMR uh, which decreases the incidence of uh, infection and uh, is uh, considered as a preventive measure. Apart from this you also have chronic recurrent parotitis, uh, chronic sclerosing uh, sialadenitis which is also known as Kuttner's tumor which was identified by Kuttner in 1896. Um, which is commonly a condition uh, which is a chronic inflammatory reaction secondary to ductal obst uh, obstruction and uh, subsequent salivary stasis. However, salivary obstruction is proposed to be the main uh, factor as pathogenesis for this uh, phenomenon or the Kuttner's uh, tumor. Um, and uh, clinically it presents as a painful heart swelling of the submandibular salivary gland and uh, is uh, uh, which it, uh, it the differential diagnosis can be chronic sialadenitis sialolithiasis and lymphothelial lesions and uh, treatment uh, usually managed by surgical excision of the involved gland and chances of recurrence recurrence is found to be a little uh, rare apart from this there is also hepatitis c virus associated uh, sialadenitis hiv related uh, sialadenitis uh, uh, other factors uh, involved, uh, there is iodine deficiency uh, uh, involving uh, sialadenitis, which all share the same type of uh, uh, symptom. Moving on to sialolithiasis. Uh, uh, Sialoliths uh, mostly often develop within the ductal system of the submandibular salivary gland. And the formation of the lith uh, within the uh, 
parotid gland is uh, less frequent compared to that of uh, submandibular gland. Um, this is due to the torturous and upward path of the submandibular duct and, uh, and the thicker and uh, mucoid secretion of this uh, of the submandibular gland. And uh, salivary stones can uh, occur in uh, almost any age, but uh, they are most commonly seen in uh, uh, young and middle-aged uh, adults. Uh, major gland uh, sialolites are uh, most frequently uh, most frequently cause episodic pain and swelling of the affected uh, gland, uh, especially during the meal time uh, because uh, of the increased production of the saliva. The severity of the symptom, however, varies depending on the degree of obstruction and the amount of uh, uh, the back pressure that is caused uh, within the gland due to uh, salivary retention. And uh, the stone is, uh, if the uh, the stone is located at the terminal portion of the duct, uh, hard mass can also sometimes be palpated beneath the mucosa. Uh, the silo look generally, uh, uh, you know, typically appear as a, a radio opaque mass in the, in, uh, when you uh, radiograph it. Uh, however, not uh, like I told you previously, not all stones are visible on standard radiographs. About 60% uh, you can uh, uh, you can see them uh, in standard. Uh, plain film radiographs, uh, more than about 20 to 40 percent might not be actually visible in uh, plain film radiographs because of the degree or the amount of calcification uh, of the silolith. Uh, this evidently varies. So uh, additional examinations apart from clinical history and uh, 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 examination uh, such as uh, conventional tomography or an MRI. Uh, will have to be performed uh, to identify the uh, uh, salivary stone. Uh, the composition of the salivary stone is generally an hydroxyapatite crystal, calcium phosphate, magnesium and potassium uh, with uh, ammonium. And uh, in terms of uh, gout, you can also see uh, uric acid content with uh, silolith. And uh, uh, like we discussed uh, earlier, uh, the diagnosis generally uh, uh, is with the clinical uh, history and examination and uh, palpation of the duct. Uh, so we we'll do a bimanual palpation. Bimanual palpation, uh, if you all remember, uh, we use both the hands, one hand on the outer side and the other hand uh, intraorally, one hand extraorally. And uh, we try to get a hold of the duct, uh, let it be the parotid duct or the submandibular duct. Uh, whereas in uh, submandibular is concerned, uh, more than the duct, it's the gland uh, that is identified by manual palpation. And you by manually try to palpate uh, along. And in most of the cases, in larger lids, you will be actually able to feel the uh, salivary calculi uh, between your fingers. And uh, small silolites of major glands sometimes can be treated uh, conservatively um, uh, with gentle massage of the gland and effort to milk uh, milk the gland. And uh, and uh, um, you can also prescribe silogogs. And uh, in some times, uh, silolites might have to be uh, removed uh, surgically, which brings us to the concept of uh, silendoscopy. Uh, we will be uh, discussing silendoscopy a little bit in further lithotripsy and silendoscopy a little bit more uh, during the second part of the lecture. Uh, apart from this, uh, there is uh, uh, something called as a shockwave lithotripsy, salivary gland endoscopy and radiographically guided basket uh, retrieval of uh, can also be done uh, for removal of uh, silolith from major salivary glands. Uh, but uh, since these uh, instruments are very expensive and it's not something that is very commonly procured among, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not something that is very commonly procured. So what happens is that uh, uh, in most of the cases, in most of the general uh, practice, uh, we end up uh, removing the gland uh, which is affected uh, with the silolith. 
because uh, there are other glands to compensate for the uh, you know for the surgically excised glands uh, generally that results in uh, removal of the entire uh, gland uh, that is how it is going so far uh, moving on to necrotizing xylem metaplasia uh, the etiology of it is due to local ischemic injury of the salivary gland lobules and uh, it may be preceded by trauma or local anesthetic injury or it may sometimes appear simultaneously i mean spontaneously uh, clinical presentation is uh, both major and minor cerebral glands can be affected and uh, heart palate is the most common site and usually presents itself unilaterally and uh, initially it's a very painful uh, uh, some mucosal swelling and uh, it is very dysesthetic and uh, ultimately uh, a central necrotic crater develops uh, because of which is it is named uh, necrotizing xylem metaplasia it may end up uh, extend to or involved of uh, deep soft tissues and palatal bone but uh, the thing is that necrotizing xylem metaplasia is very self benign and self limiting reactive and uh, inflammatory lesion thus uh, is very uh, uh, yes the prognosis is very good with uh, treatment and uh, diagnosis is generally with uh, microscopic uh, findings and treatment generally follows up with uh, symptomatic treatment prognosis is generally very good with uh, necrotizing of xylem moving on to xyloria or xylosis the etiology is uh, can be varied uh, it might uh, be idiopathic uh, it can be due to parkinsonism it can be observed in parkinsonism and uh, sometimes newly apply inserted oral appliances uh, appliances uh, some expect origins uh, neostic mind and uh, other factors clinical presentation is excess production of uh, saliva which results in drooling of saliva so patient will or in a very short duration of time uh, there will be so much pooling of saliva within the oral cavity uh, thus the patient is not able to swallow it anymore or patient loses the Uh, sensation of capacity and uh, because of which there will be some drooling and uh, sometimes it might lead to uh, angular chelosis and uh, diffused uh, submandibular parotid gland uh, enlargement diagnosis is with uh, direct observation uh, and analysis of history and uh, measurement of salivary flow rate and the uh, treatment is done with scopolamine uh to reduce the salivary flow and uh, if related to medication use an alternate medication can be chosen if possible moving on to a very important topic in terms of uh, uh dental practitioners uh, xerostomia it is a, it is defined as a uh, subjective sensation of oral dryness uh, that may or may not be associated with the uh, reduction in salivary output uh, it it is a very it may be a very transient prolonged or a permanent uh, uh, disability uh, depending upon the condition and uh, the cause for uh, xerostomia um, the temporary causes are generally uh, psychological causes due to anxiety or depression drug therapy drugs that uh, exert anticholinergic uh, effects and uh, decrease the volume of uh, serous saliva such as uh, anticholinergic drugs such as atropine antihypertensive drugs such as uh, uh, methyl dopa antihistamines uh, diphenhydramine uh, which is used in cough syrups antidepressants such as amitriptyline antipsychotics such as diazepam uh, parkinsonism uh, parkinsons anti parkinsons drugs such as procycline antiemetics or uh, drugs that prevent vomiting such as hyoscin anti spasmodic such as tizidin uh, these drugs uh, that uh, exert uh, sympathomimetic action and produce more viscous and uh, mucous saliva with less volume or nasal decongestants uh, appetite suppressants bronchodilators and amphetamines some drugs may also exert uh, neural effects in uh, higher centers of the brain Uh, by simulating the adrenal receptors in the frontal cortex so it can uh, hence it can uh, uh, create some inhibitory effects on the salivary nuclei and apart from that uh, other uh, reasons can be due to a ductal calculi that is uh, salivary stone which blocks the major salivary gland uh, especially the submandibular salivary gland 
and uh, which if left untreated can lead to fibrosis of the gland and thus uh, leading to permanent uh, xerostomia and infections uh, such as silenitis um, and um, um, which can be caused by mumps uh, post operative parotitis and chronic conditions like swellings related to nutritional deficiency iodine hypersensitivity uh, all these conditions causes uh, hyposalivation and uh, hence uh, leading to xerostomia just like i mentioned before so uh, it can, can be a temporary or a permanent thing or just uh, for the time being thing and uh, some other permanent causes for uh, uh, xerostomia can be salivary gland aphasia uh, aplasia jogren syndrome uh, which is a combination of xerostomia xerophthalmia and uh, Uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other systemic uh, disorders such as diabetes mellitus parkinson's disease cystic fibrosis sarcoidosis uh, vitamin a riboflavin and nicotinic acid deficiencies and uh, in other anemias surgery or trauma to the uh, ducts uh, radiation therapy uh, uh, seen as another major uh, reason for uh, you know permanent disability to uh, you know uh, that might lead to xerostomia and uh, uh, these uh, conditions does not necessarily only uh, compromise the saliva uh, just in terms of volume but they can also kind of like uh, compromise the saliva in terms of its quality uh, that is uh, decreased in uh, the immunoglobulins and the buffering capacity uh, increased magnesium calcium potassium and sodium Uh, chloride uh, like all these altered uh, combinations as to what uh, uh, we we discussed uh, when we discussed the uh, composition of the saliva and uh, uh, the signs and symptoms for uh, xerostomia are generally that uh, lips are often cracked due to and peeling and atrophic buccal mucosa might be corrugated and pale uh, the tongue might be smooth and red red and inflamed cracked cracked or fissured with loss of papillation that is depapillation and uh, increase in erosion and, and and caries in the tooth uh, particularly uh, on the root surfaces and even uh, cuspal involvement uh, as we all know that uh, general uh, dental caries usually occurs mostly in the uh, you know in the grooves in the grooves or the pits uh, but uh, in systemic when there is a systemic involvement Uh, always look for caries in uh, the root areas and also in the cuspal uh, areas which is a very uncommon site for uh, food lodgement and uh, hence leading to caries and uh, sometimes uh, erythematous candidiasis can be present uh, because of the lack of saliva and its uh, you know slush and antibacterial property uh, there is something called as a lipstick sign it is not uh, considered a very uh, you know uh, it is not an approved kind of uh, it is not approved in many circles in uh, certain uh, among certain specialists um, but again it's a very uh, uh, it is very literal and uh, it has been mentioned in many um, texts uh, lipstick sign where uh, uh, there is an uh, shed of uh, epithelial uh, Uh, epithelial cells on the labial surface of the maxillary anterior teeth as the mucus adheres to the tooth uh, due to reduced uh, saliva and then we have tongue blade sign which is again very uh, common and uh, which can be used as a uh, clinical indicator uh, to identify uh, xerostomia when uh, tongue blade is held against a buccal mucosa the tissue adheres to the tongue blade and uh, is lifted along with the tongue blade Uh, sometimes we use the back of the mouth mirror to you know demonstrate the same and uh, when you ask the patient to produce saliva a viscous sticky saliva with difficulty in speaking and swallowing uh, patient will generally produce a clicking kind of a sound uh, when because of the tongue adhering to the other surface of the mucosa and uh, uh, there is generally halitosis uh, bad breath with altered taste dysgeusia and uh, smell and uh, gingivitis uh, there is complaining sometimes patient might complain of burning mucosa that is uh, burning mouth uh, and uh, sometimes can also lead to ulceration in oral mucosa 
and uh, uh, when uh, uh, when you want to uh, determine how much saliva is produced we generally ask the patient to open the mouth and hold the saliva in their mouth uh, without swallowing so when you ask the patient to do that in patients with zero som- zero stomia there is not that much accumulation of saliva in the floor of the mouth and uh, there is uh, uh, the process become poorly fitting and can cause extensive trauma if uh, being forced on because of the lack of uh, lubrication that is produced by saliva and there is enlargement of the uh, salivary glands and uh, zero stomia associated uh, uh, disorders can be dental caries uh, dry mouth dysgeusia dysphagia oral candidiasis and bacterial infections as i mentioned before so treatment of uh, zero stomia we start with uh, something called as preventive therapy where patients already show signs of uh, zero stomia uh, and uh, in these cases uh, mostly with uh, uh, you know where patients show signs of xerostomia we can start with uh, topical fluoride application uh, we can uh, advise the patient of uh, you know moistening the mouth with uh, water or we can, to improve uh, salivary uh, gland secretion uh, you can ask the patient to you know uh, locally activate salivary secretion with you know something citric uh, or uh, some uh, chewing gums uh, which can you know increase mechanically uh, produce more uh, saliva symptomatic therapy um, and sometimes local or topical salivary stimulation by uh, application of uh, certain uh, uh, drugs and uh, and uh, systemically uh, with drugs and uh, therapy uh, sometimes uh, if there is an underlying disease uh, the manager of that so preventive therapy like i told you supplemental fluorides uh, remineralizing solutions uh, optimal oral hygiene and non cariogenic right. symptomatic treatment is with water oral rinses gels mouthwashes and uh, artificial saliva is the latest although artificial saliva is not a very go to method because uh, it is very expensive and uh, most of the patients are not very convinced with the as in with the taste or the sensation that artificial saliva generally it gives uh, you can increase humidification by moistening your mouth with uh, you know some viscous fluid uh, um, traditional therapy include uh, application of uh, uh, gingelly oil uh, um, over the uh, mucosal surfaces or various types of oils over the mucosal surfaces to increase the moisture and there is a very common concept called uh, oil pulling uh, which is becoming very uh, popular in uh, india uh, in india where they rinse the mouth with uh, oil and uh, uh, minimize caffeine and alcohol which can prevent uh, uh, salivary local and topical uh, salivary stimulation such as uh, electric stimulation with uh, acupuncture and uh, salivary sugar free gums and mints um uh, with citrus uh, you know peels uh, chewing citrus peels can all you know kind of mechanically and uh, supply salivary uh, secretion uh, all this is applicable only if the salivary gland uh, capacity is diminished not when it is totally out when it is totally out all of the above said measures is not going to really help and uh, when it is partially uh, working you can uh, Uh, induce systemic stimulation with the of secretogogs such as bromex and mm, antitriotherulone and uh, which is mucolytic and pilocarpin which is a parasympathomimetic drug uh, which is also a cholinergic agonist and uh, it is mostly used in uh, radiotherapy cases in, in jogren syndrome uh, adverse effects of uh, pilocarpin are sweating uh, hot flashes urinating uh, frequency in urination diarrhea and blood visions also sevimelin uh, can also be used in uh, uh, treatment of uh, xerostomia rheumatoid arthritis uh, there is uh, increased prevalence of uh, human leukocyte antigen and uh, auto antibody production against uh, nuclear antigen and uh, there is potential role for uh, viruses and retroviruses as cofactors Uh, like i said before uh, it is a combination of xerostomia xerophthalmia and uh, rheumatoid arthritis 
so there is salivary and lacrimal gland enlargement in one third of the cases in uh, jogren syndrome secondary effects uh, are uh, dental caries oral candidiasis and uh, ocular and corneal discomfort primary forms uh, the exocrine dysfunction dominates and in secondary form exocrine dysfunction and associated autoimmune conditions usually rheumatoid arthritis and lupus erythematosus for diagnosis is by demonstration of uh, objective xerostomia and xerophthalmia so we have to put the symptoms together uh, in the patient uh, to diagnose a patient with jogren syndrome uh, followed by serologic demonstration uh, with associated ssc and ssb antibodies Um, correlation of the clinical and serologic findings and demonstration presence of uh, periductal lymphocytic sialadenitis treatment is generally directed at uh, associated connective tissue or autoimmune disease and uh, sometimes uh, systemic corticosteroids are uh, given to the patient if acute symptoms arise usually uh, symptomatic and uh, preventive therapies are used such what we use in uh, Uh, the case of xerostomia the preventive uh, you know uh, superficial or systemic treatments are given along with uh, uh, um, management of other symptoms uh, which we will be generally directing to an ophthalmologist or a general physician generally but uh, uh, i want you to uh, get attention on the carboxymethyl cellulose sodium uh, this drug is a common drug that is being used to moisture uh, that is used in uh, moisture uh, uh, in eye drops as well as uh, the oral suspension liquids uh, which are used topically in the oral cavity uh, to increase moisture so uh, these are uh, the clinical symptoms and treatment of jogren syndrome there are going to be other uh, diseases and disorders that we are uh, going to follow in the other classes and uh, we'll discuss those uh, other uh, salivary gland diseases and disorders in the part 2 of the lecture uh, soon uh, stay safe take care